Hey everybody, welcome to our next lecture in the work energy series where we're going to focus on a very, very important topic in physics called energy. Now, energy comes in all kinds of forms, whether it's heat, light, electrical, chemical, um, nuclear, whatever you want to look at it. Uh, but what is energy? How would we define energy? If you think about it, we use energy to make things happen. For example, we use energy in our body to make our body do things. We put energy, gas, into a car to make it do things, to go. Um, so no matter what, we always seem to be using energy in order to do something. So the best way to define energy is the ability to do work. Clearly, in order to affect change, to apply forces, we're going to need some source of energy to do that. So energy is the ability to do work. Now that means right away there must be some sort of relationship between work and energy. We'll see where that comes in later. It's very important. Although energy comes in many forms, there are really only three major categories of energy. Now all these other energies, heat, light, things like that, can be a, either one of these categories or a combination of them. But the first type is called kinetic energy, which I'll abbreviate as Ke. Now the word kinetic implying motion, and that's exactly how you define it energy due to motion. So anytime something has a velocity, it has motion, it automatically has kinetic energy. The next type is called potential energy, which I'll abbreviate with PE. Now although there's only one type of kinetic due to motion, there are lots of versions of potential energy. Because potential energy, in the physics definition, is often given as energy due to position. But a more common one is stored energy. Okay? Your potential energy is energy you sort of stored up, getting ready to use. Okay? So that might be a better one to use. But its physics definition is energy due to position. The third category is known as rest energy, abbreviated with simply an E. This is known as energy due to mass. Now this is something that Einstein discovered and led to the idea of nuclear energy, that anything that has mass can be converted into pure energy. And it turns out a lot of energy. We'll sort of talk about it a little bit later. So, to begin with, how do we determine these things? Well, let's start with kinetic energy. The formula of kinetic energy is 1 half mass times velocity squared. 1 half mv squared. So let's look at an example. Here we have our baseball pitcher who is going to use his arm to start a ball from rest, accelerate it over 2 meters, and release it at 20 meters per second. And the idea is then, how much kinetic energy does he give the ball in the throw? Well, it's not too tough. Kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared, 1 half, we have a mass of 0.2. It's released at 20 meters per second. That's at its highest velocity, so it's maximum kinetic energy. And that comes out to 40 joules. Now, there's something very interesting here, because if you remember our previous lecture on work, we did this example before. Here's where we did this example, where we found how much work the pitcher did to throw the ball. And notice we got 40 joules. Well, that's interesting. It took 40 joules of work and we ended up with 40 in terms of our kinetic energy. And in fact, the unit of energy happens to be the joule also. So this turns out to be a very, very important concept. Energy may be defined as the ability to do work, but if you do a certain amount of work, you can also give something a very specific amount of energy. And this is sometimes known as the work energy theorem, that your work and in later on, we'll look at what's called the change in energy, how much you change your energy, are basically they're always going to be the same thing. Both measured in joules, both have the same value. Now, in turn, if this ball went off and hit someone in the head, then the maximum amount of work they could do on their head is 40 joules. So work and energy are very much related to each other. They're basically interchangeable. Now, potential energy. Well. The formula for potential energy is mass times gravity times height, but like I said, where there's one kinetic energy, there are many potential energies. 
This specifically is called gravitational potential energy. And it occurs when you give something a position or a height and there's gravity around. So let's look at an example of that. Okay, so here's our weightlifter. Who's going to lift this over their head? And if you remember from our previous example in work, lifted at about 2.2 meters. And now at this point, because the barbell has a height of 2.2 meters in the air, this point, the barbell is said to have some gravitational potential energy. We stored some energy up there. Because if we let go of that barbell, we can release that energy. And so that potential energy would be the mass, 80 kilograms, gravity is 10, height of 2.2 meters, which gives you 1,760 joules. Well, it's no coincidence that when we did this example before, we found out that the amount of work it took to actually lift this up was also 1,760 joules. So work can also be how much you change your potential energy. Because that had zero at the bottom and 1760 at the top. Just like kinetic had zero at the beginning, no velocity, but 40 joules at the end. So work and energy, very much interchangeable. Potential energy, though, can be tricky because it is an energy due position. And position is a very relative thing. So, for example, if you were standing on top of a building holding a two kilogram brick, okay, well, and let's say there's a little ledge sticking out here. Well, depending on where you let that brick plan to land, it could end up dropping, let's say, five meters down to the ledge, or it could drop 15 meters, say, all the way to the ground. So, again, position is a relative term because technically this brick has two different potential energies. That's why it's energy due to position. Okay? You would get a different energy effect or a different work at 5 meters versus 15 meters. So, for example, at 5 meters, mass is 2, gravity is 10, height of 5 that would give you 100 joules of potential energy, which means on the ledge, the maximum work you could do is 100 joules. However, at ground level, mass is still 2, gravity is 10, but now this is 15, that gives you 300 joules of potential energy. So you can do three times the amount of work because you've got three times the amount of distance. So again, potential energy is a very relative term. You always have to be careful where you're beginning and where you're ending. Rest energy is this equation. E equals mc squared, a equation made famous by Einstein. Most people call it his theory of relativity. It's actually his equation for rest mass. Uh, the letter C stands for the speed of light. Um, the, three, the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So basically a really, really big number. So what Einstein was saying, if it only takes a very small amount of mass to yield an enormous amount of energy, which eventually became the idea of nuclear power and the unfortunate side effect of the atomic bomb. But that's a little beyond what we plan to do here. We're only going to focus on kinetic energy and potential energy, and we're going to not really talk about rest energy. That's much more advanced. Now, as I mentioned before, energy is measured in joules, just like work. And again, that's why work and energy can be set equal to each other, because they are both in the same unit um, and are both very much related to each other. But there's one other sort of energy thing I want to look at, and that's the idea of what I'm going to call TE, which stands for total energy. You see, at any given moment, you can have both position and velocity. So like I said, something can have more than one type of energy at once. And so it's not so important to know what the kinetic energy is or to know what the potential energy is, but it is very important to know what the total energy is and to see how those sort of interrelate to each other. So let's look at an example. So what I've got here is a skater and a ramp. Now you'll notice here this graph here on the side, it's about energy. It has kinetic energy, potential energy, 
thermal or heat energy. We're not going to really look at that right now. And it's total energy. So what I'm going to do, now right now he's sitting at rest on the ground. So notice there are no energies on the chart here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring him up to a height, let's say around 6 meters here or so. Now, notice right away that my potential energy jumped up here and my total energy jumped up to the same amount. Now, that's because he has height, position, but he's not yet moving. Okay, There's no velocity, so there is no kinetic energy. Now, let's let him go. Now, notice a couple things that immediately begin to happen as he falls. As he falls, that potential energy begins to decrease, but he starts to gain velocity as he goes down the ramp. So as his velocity goes up, his kinetic energy goes up. But notice that this total energy bar hasn't changed at all. Let's keep going. Okay. Oh. Now look, he's getting closer and closer to the bottom. His speed is getting higher and higher and higher, which makes sense. Gravity's pulling him down. His kinetic energy is going up and up and up, and his potential energy is going down, down, down. But again, notice this total energy bar remains exactly the same finally reaches the bottom. And notice that after he reached the bottom, his velocity maintained a constant value. It didn't change. All his potential energy is gone, and the only type he has is kinetic. But again, that total energy bar seems to all remain the same. So, what does that mean then about total energy? Well, again, if we look at this example, Although potential energy decreases and kinetic energy increases, that total energy never changed at all. So the total energy appeared to remain constant. Now that's got to be a pretty important idea. And the idea surrounds our first of what we call conservation laws. And conservation laws in physics kind of all say the same thing. Total is constant. Okay, so whenever you see a conservation, you'll see total and you'll see constant. In this case, conservation of energy says the total amount of energy in an isolated system always remains constant. You see that isolated system a lot. That means you're not allowed to bring things in and out. You have to look at it just as it is. But the main point is that the total amount of energy always remains constant. So whatever my total energy is that I start with is the same as my total energy that I end with. I can't lose energy. Now, you may have heard this version of the law as this. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transformed from one form to another. That's true, but not really the best definition. Let's focus as the idea that total energy simply remains constant. So let's look at an example of how we can use this idea of kinetic energy, potential energy, and total energy, along with conservation of energy. So, for example, what we've got here is a 20 kilogram crate sitting at the top of a 5 meter high ramp. And we'll assume no friction for right now. And we are going to release it from rest and let it slide down to the bottom of the ramp. And what we want to know is how fast is it going when it reaches the bottom of the ramp. Now, of course, the way we used to approach this, we would have to look at maybe free body diagrams, drawing some forces. We would definitely need to find acceleration. We need to know that distance down the ramp. We need to know a lot of stuff. But let's take it from a better perspective. Conservation of energy, which says that my total energy has to equal my total energy. So if I call up here point 0.1 and down here point 0.2, my total energy at 1 has to equal total at 2. Now, here's the best way to approach this. Look at each point and ask yourself two questions. Do I have height? Do I have velocity? And that will tell you the type or types of energy you have. So for example, up here at point one, I do have height, but I don't have velocity. So since I only have height, the only type of energy I can have at point one is gravitational potential energy, height, energy based on position. Now when I reach the bottom, the height is gone because I'm at the bottom, but I must be in motion down there. So do I have height? No. But do I have velocity? Yes. So the total energy down here consists of only kinetic energy. Well now, 
if we take a little algebra and we say the total energy at the top equals the total energy at the bottom, well, at the top I can substitute in gravitational potential energy. At the bottom I can substitute in kinetic energy. Now, do I know all those values? No, not really. But like anything, I know an equation. So if potential energy is mgh, well, let me put that there, mgh. If kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared, well, let me put that in where I have kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared. Now, here's a neat thing. I gave you the mass, but in terms of those little algebra tricks, I actually don't need it here. Because mass exists on both sides, I am allowed to cancel it out. And now I can put in the numbers I know. Gravity is 10. The height was 5. 1 half. And I'm looking for the velocity on point 2. So that's my unknown. Now a little algebra. I'll multiply by 2. So v squared is 100. I then take the square root of both sides, and I find I have a velocity of 10 meters per second when I reach the bottom. Well, it's a whole lot faster than using forces and motions and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. So conservation of energy is a very, very friendly thing to use. Okay, so that's a good introduction to the idea of kinetic energy, energy due to motion, potential energy, energy due to position or stored energy, and the most important idea of conservation of energy, that the total energy at all points remains constant. See you next time.